Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we're going to be checking out variant 2 of May June 2023 9700. This is the walkthrough of the MCQ in AS Biology. And let's get started. Question number 1. A grad school on a micrometer scale can be used to measure the size of a bi biological structures that are viewed with a microscope, which row shows the correct locations for the placement of the grad and the micrometer scale on the microscope shown. Okay, in order to place the grad then you have to make sure to place the grad on the eyepiece lens. Okay, however, for the micrometer scale, it's going to be placed on a slide, and the slide is going to be placed on the stage. That's number three. Okay, so number three for the micrometer scale, and grad is for number one. Let's repeat. Number two, six organelles found in eukaryotic cells are shown. Okay, which organelles are involved in the synthesis and secretion of glycoprotein? Let's label the organelles that we have. Here we have the nucleus. For number one is a nucleus. Okay, so here you can see I labeled everything with its very summarized functions. Usually you'd say the functions maybe to five up to six points for each of these guys. But I just listed out the stuff that's mo most important for this type of question. So I can, you can see the nucleus, I labeled it basically number one with transcription is the synthesis of mRNA in the nucleus with the use of DNA synth strand as a template. So if you're not familiar with protein synthesis yet, maybe you still did not start the chapter yet, you need to know basically that the nucleus is site of transcription. Protein synthesis is basically the synthesis of proteins and here they're asking about glycoproteins glycoproteins have to be formed first by protein synthesis and then the protein being combined with a uh, basically carbohydrate right and so for the protein to be formed we have two things happening so protein synthesis involves two processes okay you have transcription and translation Okay, transcription is a process that happens inside the nucleus and so mRNA is basically going to be formed in this stage. What is mRNA? mRNA is so it's a copy of the part of DNA which we are interested in because we know that DNA cannot leave the nucleus. All right, it wants to stay home, and so let's call DNA the code. It's gonna stay where it is. We're gonna create a copy that's mRNA. It's gonna leave. It's gonna go to the ribosome or the place where it's translated during translation. So what exactly is being translated, and why is it being translated? Well, just like in the computers where we have zeros and ones that we can't understand that have to be translated into words for us, the DNA is written in a way that the cell doesn't really understand. Cells understand proteins. They don't understand A, C, T, G, which are basically the bases that form up the DNA, uh, basically part of DNA. Okay, so the ACTG in this case are going to be translated to amino acids, which are going to be combining together during translation. So the transcription, the first stage of protein synthesis, is actually in the nucleus. The synthesis of mRNA in the nucleus with the use of specifically the sense strand, because the other strand is just a complementary strand, because, you know, DNA is double-stranded and one of its strands is going to have all the codes and then the other strand is just going to be complementary to it and it's just there for, you know, stability reasons, okay? And so the DNA sense strand is going to be copied and used as a template for mRNA and that all happens inside the nucleus and here you can see the DNA okay or the chromatin now for mitochondrion the mitochondrion over here basically it is obviously the site of synthesis of energy or atp and so atp here is going to be broken down to release energy or hydrolyzed to release energy and energy obviously is required because this is an anabolic reaction what do i mean by anabolic reaction anabolic reaction is a basically the synthesis of a large a large molecule from a smaller simpler one and that's basically uh, yes, yeah, so a larger complex molecule from a smaller simpler one, like in the case of protein synthesis, you're synthesizing a large complex protein from smaller simpler amino acids. So obviously energy is required for this, so we can check one and two. So far, centrioles, I wrote down, it's involved in organizing microtubules or spindle fibers during cell division, and so you can see its function is really relative to cell division. R is protein synthesis or the synthesis of glycoproteins um, and involved in any in any kind absolutely not okay it's not involved in the synthesis of proteins or in glycoproteins it's just involved in cell division so we can cancel out number three for number four we can see we have the rough endoplasmic reticulum rer and it's got ats ribosomes that's why it has this rough appearance because it has ats ribosomes on its surface and we know ribosomes are the site of basically tra uh, base translation and protein synthesis and not, not to mention that uh, RER of endoplasmic reticulums actually has a function of transport okay right it's going to be you know packaging and and transporting 
and basically isolating obviously the proteins formed by the ATS ribosomes or the polypeptides formed by the ATS ribosomes in shuttle vesicles which are going to be released and sent off to number six the Golgi apparatus the Golgi apparatus here we can see some vesicles coming here like the shuttle vesicle containing the polypeptide polypeptide over here is going to be processed okay so polypeptide will be processed and then it's going to undergo glycosylation what's glycosylation it's basically the fusion of a protein with a carbohydrate to form a glycoprotein and so this glycoprotein synthesis happens exactly in number six so number six is with us number five chloroplast obviously not chloroplast has a role in photosynthesis nothing to do with protein synthesis yes it is going to have protein synthesis happening inside of it because it has 70 s ribosomes and it has dna does this mean that it is involved as an organelle within the cells protein synthesis obviously not okay so we can choose one two four and six okay which is letter b number three which cell structures can have mRNA inside them chloroplasts mitochondrial nucleus rough endoplasmic reticulum well, from the start here, we can see that chloroplasts do have mRNA inside of them because just as we said in the previous uh, question, MR, uh, chloroplasts do synthesize proteins. So obviously, they require DNA for that. They require DNA to carry out transcription and everything. And we also we already know that chloroplasts have circular DNA, which are, current, which are used for protein synthesis. And part of protein synthesis is transcription, which is the synthesis of mRNA. And so chloroplasts uh, have mRNA inside of them. Same thing for mitochondria because they also have... Uh, circular DNA and 70 S ribosomes and carry out uh, transcription and translation to form proteins such as you know the enzymes that they have ATP synthase and all the other enzymes that we know and uh, nucleus of course uh, the nucleus has mRNA inside of it because transcription mainly happens inside the nucleus as we've mentioned before and nucleus basically uh, has these nuclear pores which are basically just like the, you can imagine them as gates which allow the mRNA to then leave the nucleus Right, this is mRNA, and it's leaving the nucleus through the nuclear pores to go find the ribosomes and carry out translation. So, of course, yes, the nucleus does have mRNA inside of it right when they are produced. Now, for rough endoplasmic reticulum, well, we know that the rough endoplasmic reticulum can have mRNA bind on top of it to the ATS ribosomes, but no, it does not itself contain inside of it mRNA. And so we can cancel out option four, and that leaves us with one, two, three only question number four a scientist carried out an experiment to separate organelles in an animal cell by mass the scientist mixed the cells with a buffer solution which has which had the same water potential as the cells the cells were broken open with a blender to release the organelles the extracted mixture was filtered and then spun in a centrifuge at a high speed to separate the heaviest type of organelle these sank to the bottom forming solid pellet one perfect now the liquid above pellet one was poured into a clean centrifuge so here we're filtering okay and then spun in the centrifuge at a higher speed to separate the next heaviest type of organelle and these organelles sank to the bottom to form solid pellet two okay interesting this procedure was repeated twice more to obtain pellets three and four containing a single type of organelle what is the main function of the organelle in pellet two okay now we're going to be looking at the functions here and basically labeling all of these organelles and based on that i do i assuming the positions of the pellets okay assuming which pellets they're going to be so let's look at the functions the first one digestion of old organelles that is the function of the smooth or rough endoplasmic reticulum which is basically known as autophagy now so basically this function is going to be of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum or rough endoplasmic reticulum which are going to have maybe an intermediate size okay production of atp is the function of the mitochondrion which let me tell you it has a heavier size compared to the smooth and rough in the plasma reticulum it's a double membrane organelle so this has a bigger mass than this okay so it's going to be in a first one of the first pellets compared to this okay production of mrna that's the function of the nucleus who if you do not know is 10 micrometers in diameter double membrane organelle with lots of things inside of it like the nucleoplasm which has lots of stuff inside of it like the nucleoli nucleoli are also three micrometers in diameter and they're huge in size and so obviously they're going this is going to have obviously the biggest mass so we can maybe say that it's found in pellet one okay for synthesis of protein that's mainly the function of ribosomes which could be 80s or 70s of size that doesn't matter in the end they could be between like almost 20 nanometers if we you take the average of all of them so they're 20 nanometers only 
And if they're 20 nanometers, obviously, can we compete with a nucleus, with the mitochondria, with the smooth or rough in the plasma reticulum? Obviously not. They're going to be, obviously, in pellet 4. Okay, now we identified this, and we know that this has a bigger mass, so it's going to be in pellet 3. Okay, I'm sorry, pellet 2. However, pellet 3 is going to be the one with a lower mass. So that's so smooth and rough in the plasma reticulum. So B is mitochondrion and it's going to have this function question number five which structures are found in palisade mesophyll cells and photosynthetic prokaryotes let's see cell surface membrane yes cellulose cell wall uh, actually no because in the mesophyll cells yes we do have a cell wall however i'm sorry palisade cellulose cell wall however in photosynthetic prokaryotes we have a peptidoglycan cell wall what does peptidoglycan mean it's another type of carbohydrate however it's not the same as cellulose okay Ribosomes, yes, both have ribosomes, however, they have it of different types. But if both prokaryotes only have 70S ribosomes, palisade mesophyll cells have both 70S and 80S ribosomes. And if you're curious, 70S, S basically being a Svetsberg unit, that's the type of unit we use with centrifusion, and that just indicates the size of the ribosome. So 70 is smaller than 80, and so these are basically having lower mass compared to the 80S ribosomes. Now, going back to what we, we were discussing, chloroplasts no because only plant cells are going to have chloroplasts however for photosynthetic prokaryotes they're not going to have any types of membrane organelles they're only going to have non-membrane organelles like for example ribosomes ribosomes are non-membrane organelles however chloroplasts are double membranes they're not going to have them you're going to say where do they carry out photosynthesis well they have these in foldings okay or inner foldings in their cell membranes which are basically going to have things like chemicals and enzymes that are going to be involved in photosynthesis and also photosynthetic pigments like chlorophyll a chlorophyll b and so on okay now these inner foldings are actually called mesosomes or mesosomes i'm not sure how they're spelled however this is no longer part of your syllabus it's just extra information which polymers are present in all viruses and all prokaryotes? Let's look at this. We have polynucleotides, polypeptides, and polysaccharides. Now, we have to be familiar with the structure of viruses. We have in viruses a nucleic acid core that's going to have either DNA or RNA, which is basically a polynucleotide, by the way. Okay. And then, on the outside, we can have the capsid, which is basically the protein coat. So, obviously, we're going to have a polypeptide and polynucleotide. Polysaccharides, however, we're not going to have. So it's really just one and two. Which set of steps is the best method for conducting an emulsion test for lipids? Okay, this should be, you know, obviously very familiar for you if you have done your practicals and your labs yet. But if you didn't, it's fine. You just have to keep on reviewing it for your labs. Now add two centimeters cubed to the waters, uh, of water to the sample. Pour the water into the test tube containing two centimeters cubed of ethanol. Lipids are present in the mixture become cloudy. Okay, add two centimeters cubed of ethanol to the sample and shake. Pour the ethanol into a test tube containing two centimeters cubed of water and boil. Lipids are present in if the sample becomes clear, obviously not. Add 2 centimeters cubed of water to the sample and shake. Pour the water into the test tube containing 2 centimeters cubed of ethanol and boil. There's no boiling. Add 2 centimeters cubed of ethanol to the sample and shake. Pour the ethanol to the test tube containing 2 centimeters cubed of water and shake again. Lipids are present if the mixture becomes cloudy. Yes, this is correct. Okay, you start by adding ethanol and then you add the water and then you shake. And if it becomes cloudy, then obviously... Okay, so you take the ethanol from here. So the ethanol first is going to be added to the food mixture. Once you're done, you're going to take the liquid part after shaking. Okay, you're going to take only the liquid part and leave the solid part by filtering. And pour this liquid part into a tube already containing water. Okay, distilled water. And then you're going to shake everything. And if it turns cloudy, then it's going to have lipids. A student was provided with a solution of carbohydrate. They removed two samples from the solution and performed tests on each sample as shown. Interesting. So carbohydrate solution, sample one, they did Bendix test, Bendix solution remained blue, meaning it has no carbohydrates. However, sample two, boiled with added hydrochloric acid, or maybe it has non-reducing sugars because the Bendix test is a test for reducing sugars. So maybe it has non-reducing sugars, okay? Uh, for boiled with dilute hydrochloric acid and then neutralized with dilute sodium hydroxide and then Bendix test. So this is hydrolysis in order to, you know, see if there's reducing sugars. This is the non-reducing sugars test extra steps, okay? Sugars test. So then we have Bendix solution turned yellow. So if it's a Bendix solution is turned yellow, that means that there's a low concentration of non-reducing sugars. Okay, which statements explain the results? So the condensation reactions occurs in the sample to, 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 to release the reducing sugar. Actually, it's hydrolysis. 
so that's wrong. Glycidic bonds in a polysaccharide have been broken down to release a reducing sugar. That is correct. Okay, an alpha glucose bond in sucrose, for example, in case it's sucrose, maybe it's something else. However, the only reducing sugar that we're familiar with in the syllabus is sucrose. So yes, it's going to be broken down and releasing reducing sugars like glucose, right? And sample one shows that sucrose is present in the carbohydrate solution. No, sample one does not show anything. It can tell you that either sucrose is present or non-reducing sugar is present to be more precise or nothing is present. It's totally fine the way you interpret it. However, it's more accurate to say that, you know, it could have, a, you know, no, non, it, in other words, you can say it's just no reducing sugars. That's the most accurate way of interpreting it. You cannot just assume that there are reducing sugars and you cannot assume that there are no non-reducing sugars. Okay, sample one shows that sucrose is present. And the carbohydrate solution, as I mentioned, that's wrong. And the change in color to a yellow solution shows that glucose is present. Actually, no, because the reducing sugar test shows that there was no reducing sugars to begin with. So glucose, fructose, lactose are all not present. So the answer is B. Which molecules contain at least two double bonds? So we have the options sucrose, collagen, and hemoglobin. We know that collagen and hemoglobin contain way more than just two double bonds because we know that collagen and hemoglobin are formed of amino acids and each amino acid itself has a double bond and what's it called even after the bonding between amino acids the double bonds remain because the carboxyl group is going to bind but it's not the, via the oxygen it has a double bond so if we look at the carboxyl group and the amine group when there is an amine bond forming here is the water that's lost and this is the bond between two amino acids and we can see there is a double bond here and so it actually and we know that collagen and hemoglobin are both polymers and so obviously they have lots and lots of double bonds however sucrose does not have any double bonds so the option is b describe cellulose a branch chain of one four alpha obviously not a branch chain of one four beta glucose well it's not really branched it's actually linear okay an unreactive linear chain of one four no it's actually an unreactive linear chain of one four beta that's correct okay which part of the structure of hemoglobin carries oxygen it's the heme group which is, by the way, a permanent part of the protein that's not made of amino acids, also known as the prosthetic group. What is the maximum number of hydrogen bonds that can form between two single water molecules? So let's get back to the definition of hydrogen bonds. We know that it's a relatively weak bond that forms between the by or basically by the attraction of a what's it called a small group with you know a positive charge like the hydrogen atom and another group that carries a small negative charge like the oxygen atom and so in in short it's just a weak bond that's formed between a single oxygen atom and a single hydrogen atom chemically i'm not going to be going deep into this but chemically oxygen and hydrogen are basically i'm sorry water molecules are not going to face each other are going to face each other in such a way that it allows for this to happen so they're going to face each other like this Right, they allow for oxygen to be in front of hydrogen, hydrogen to be in front of oxygen. So let's say this is hydrogen, this is oxygen. A single water a single oxygen molecule will form a bond with a single hydrogen molecule. And this over here is the hydrogen bond. Okay, you can't extend another line and tell me this is going to happen because no, it's it's chemically impossible, and uh, it's you know it's a bit of a new idea. They never brought this before, but now that we know it's good that we know okay uh, water molecules are not going to be facing each other in such a way that they allow for more than what's it called um for more than one hydrogen bond to form between each single one of them obviously if you were to draw another water molecule here same thing they're going to be you know it's called arranged in such a way that allows for another single hydrogen bond to form uh so what's it called like overall here we have two hydrogen bonds but between the two single water molecules we have only one hydrogen bond and so the maximum number again is one cyp3a4 very long name i'm just going to call them c for short is an important enzyme in the human digestive system where it's needed to break down a range of different toxins so it's a very important enzyme in your digestive system necessary to break down different kinds of different kinds of toxins now the activity of c has been shown to be reduced by substances called and I'm going to call them F for short. So these will be called F. Okay, so we understand that based on this information, F are inhibitors. What type of, informa what type of inhibitors? We still don't know. Let's see. Now, F are found in some fruits and are so dangerous and, and what's it called? So dangerous concentrations of toxins may develop in the human digestive system when fruits containing F are eaten. Okay, so based on this, we understand that they are found in fruits and really dangerous concentrations can develop as a result of us eating these fruits. Okay, let's see from the information provided what can be concluded about the molecules of the enzyme C. 
Let's see. They lower the activation energy of the toxin breakdown process. Well, yes, they are necessary for breaking down toxins. So, of course, they're going to be lowering down the activation energy of that process since, you know, that's the role of enzymes in their reactions. And so, yes, of course, that's that A is correct. Okay. Uh, they bind specifically through the active site to a substrate found in some fruits. Well, uh, the substrate found in some fruits, well, okay. Um, the enzyme itself is not going to bind to the active site of the substrate. That's number one. Number two, the substrate is not going to be actually inside the fruit when it comes to the enzyme because really the enzyme is inside the digestive system. And he said that uh, the, what's it called, the toxins may develop in the human digestive system when the fruits are eaten. And so the toxins are going to be themselves found in the digestive system. Why will they go through the fruits? Anyway, B doesn't seem really cool for me. Let's see letter C. They change permanently when acted upon by these molecules. Well, from this information, we know that F are inhibitors. However, we didn't discuss what type of inhibitors F are. So we're not really sure if they're going to be changed permanently or if they're going to be changed, um, you know, temporarily, like in the case of competitive inhibitors. They resume normal activity when concentrations of F decrease. Again, we don't know the type of inhibitor. In the case of competitive inhibition, sure, if you were to decrease the, the, the concentration of the competitive inhibitor and increase the concentration of the substrate of the enzyme, you are going to be increasing the rate of reaction back to its normal rate. However, they didn't give information what kind of inhibitor we're dealing with. Therefore, we don't know for letter C or D. Uh, and so we can cancel out letter C or D. And for letter B, again, I told you that, you know, uh, the substrate doesn't really have an active site. The enzyme is the one having the active site. Number two, it's basically the fact that it's on fruit. So really, it's a sketchy answer. And letter A is pretty clear. So let's choose letter A. Now for number 14. A fixed volume and concentration of substrate and enzyme were mixed. Other variables were kept constant and the enzyme catalyzed reaction was left until it was complete. So there are fixed volume and, you know, concentration is not excess. There's no, uh, what to call, you know, uh, you know, a continuous adding of substrate to the enzyme. It's just, you know, there are fixed concentrations. The substrate would eventually get used up and that's all we know. So which graph shows how the rate of reaction changes with time? So here we can see in letter A that the rate of reaction is actually increasing. Rate of reaction on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And the rate of reaction happens to be increasing for some reason, despite the fact that the substrate is supposed to be being used up. For letter B, we can see that the rate of reaction is increasing up until a certain point, which we can see that here maybe it's reached a, you know, what's it called, limiting factor. But we know there isn't a limiting factor and that, you know, there is. this isn't the Vmax of the reaction because uh, the Vmax is going to be reached in different graphs when here we're going to have the substrate concentration increasing on the x-axis but here we have a fixed concentration of substrate so no we're not going to reach this plateau in this case for letter c we can see that yes the substrate is being used up up all the way onto zero for a short period of time and the rate of reaction is declining so c is pretty great for letter d we can see that it will increase up until a maximum point just like the graphs of ph and temperature which is really really weird for it to be placed here because they understand that ph and temperature are going to be like on the x-axis and they're actually going to be you know affecting the enzyme in itself like the structure of the enzyme and actually causing it to decline but in this case it looks like you know something has changed and we're not really sure what has changed because we know that from the beginning we had a fixed concentration of substrate and enzyme and that the end substrate will be used up forming product right so what exactly has caused this turning point that doesn't make sense so letter c is the answer Let's put number 15, which molecules in the cell surface membrane are typically involved in cell recognition? Okay, so we have cholesterol, glycolipids, glycoproteins, and phospholipids. Typically involved are going to be glycolipids, glycoproteins, and obviously, yeah, that's it, okay? So letter C. What can increase the fluidity of the cell surface membrane? Single bonds between carbon atoms in the fatty acid chain. So it means basically that there are sat unsaturated fatty acid chains. Well, actually, no. Single bonds means that they're saturated. Okay, that means that this actually is going to decrease the fluidity and not increase it. If you have double bonds between the carbon atoms, that means that they have an unsaturated chain. And obviously, unsaturated ones increase fluidity. Okay, cholesterol, yes, it is going to be increasing it. Longer fatty acid chains, actually, no. So it's letter D only. You need to have them be short shorter you need to have them have double bonds that's how you increase fluidity three main factors that affect the rate of diffusion across the membrane can be expressed by the relationship shown the rate of diffusion is proportional to the surface area times concentration difference divided by thickness of the membrane what changes in the factors would result in the rate of diffusion doubling surface area is doubled well i would guess so because if you times two to surface area then you really times twoing to 
the rate of diffusion. So that's correct, okay? Concentration of uh, difference has halved. Well, if it has halved, then obviously the rate of diffusion is going to be halved as well. So that's wrong. Thickness of the membrane has doubled. If it this if this doubles, then this is going to half. So because they're inversely proportional, since you know this is going to be one over the thickness of the membrane. So they're inversely proportional. So when this is doubled, this is halved. So actually, no, that doesn't lead to this. Thickness of the membrane is halved, yes, because when this is halved, this is doubled, as I mentioned before, they are inversely proportional. Okay, so that's why it's one and four only, which is letter C. Okay. A student measured the time taken for complete diffusion of a dye into agar blocks of different sizes which were supposed which were suspended in the dye. The results are shown. Okay. Now in the latest years you have to make sure to focus on if basically there's such a large difference between the different numbers that form the surface area. If so, then you have to make sure to pick this one of the smallest times for such cases, okay? So you can pretend that basically the diffusion distance has decreased. A lot so that makes sense like for example in the case of this we have such a short diffusion distance yet oh sorry this is not short diffusion distance make it really thin so something like this really big however really short diffusion distance and that makes the rate of diffusion of the dye completely into the agar block really really fast and so the answer is going to be one of the smallest times so letter a is the answer an experiment was carried out to investigate the effect of concentration of sucrose solution uh, on, the on cells in a plant tissue. He says that a sample of plant tissue was cut into seven cylinders of equal length and diameter. The mass of each cylinder was recorded. So we're just testing the effect of placing these potato tissues, you know, in basically different sucrose concentrations. Each of the seven cylinders was put into a different sucrose solution concentration. Okay, so we have seven cylinders, each of them placed into different concentrations. And after two hours, the cylinders were removed, blot and dry, and reweighed. Okay, so he says the percentage change in the mass of each cylinder was recorded. The graph shows the results of this investigation. Percentage change in the mass of a plant tissue, uh, plant tissue cylinder. So we can see here the, the percentage change is actually increased. So it means that they've gained water from extremely diluted solutions. In this case, we have pure water. Yes, and in this case over here, we can see that they've lost water when the percentage change is negative. That means that the volume has decreased. And so obviously they have lost water because the concentration of the solution was really high. Okay, so let's see how to explain the results if a plant tissue was placed in what's it called sucrose solution of 0 0.45 moles per diameter for per decimeters cubed. Okay, so if you're placed approximately in this concentration, we can see that we have a negative, uh, what's it called, you know, change in the mass tissue and of course 0 0.45 is a really really concentrated sucrose solution and therefore obviously we're expecting that the plant tissue will come like the potato tissue will lose some water right so basically because we are placing this potato tissue which is actually like having a relatively higher water potential or has a concentration which uh, what's it called it has a water potential that's less negative than the outside to lose water to the out to the outside, right? Water is going to move from a region of high water potential to lower water potential by osmosis, right? Into the concentrated water potential that's more negative. So let's see here the the, the question: Water potential of the cytoplasm of the cells at the start of the experiment compared with the water potential of the zero point forty five. So at the start of the experiment, as I have mentioned, the water potential inside or of the cytoplasm of the plant cells or of the potato cells. It's going to be really high. It's going to be less negative compared to the outside. So yes, less negative. And the change in the volume of the vacuoles of the cells at the end of the experiment, obviously it's going to be decreased. That were initially placed in a 0 0.45, again decreased because water is going to leave it. And you know that the va vacuole is mainly formed of water. So A is the answer. For number 20, the diagrams show part of the diagrams shows part of the organization of a section of a DNA molecule associated with histone proteins. P and R in prophase of mitosis. So we have a section of a DNA molecule, and I'm pretty sure that this organization over here is the organization of heterochromatin, which, if you don't know, we have, uh, you know, chromatin are basically these uh, thinner strands of chromatid, which actually are the strands of DNA. And so basically, the chromatin are going to be thin strands of chromatid and can either be coiled up like in the diagram. Or can be loosely, uh, what's it called, be found like in the nucleus during protein synthesis because it allows for like easier tran transcription.
okay? So which statements about features labeled PQ and R during prophase of mitosis is correct? Okay, first off, prophase of mitosis is, can, should be highlighted really, okay? Prophase, during prophase, what happens to, to DNA in general is basically that the chromatids are going to coil up, they're going to shorten, and they're going to thicken and form the chromatid. Okay, so this over here is no exception. Despite it being already coiled up a little bit, it's going to coil up even more, and it's going to become thicker, and it's going to become shorter, and it's going to form chromatid. Okay, so let's see the options. Okay, so the coiled DNA molecule forms Q and wraps around histone R to form small clusters held in place by the histone P. So we already have that formed. Okay, again, the coiled DNA forms Q and wraps it. So he's just describing what's going on here in the diagram. That's not what happens during prophase. This is just a description of heterochromatin. The groups of histone, P, and associated DNA, Q, move closer together as the chromosome condenses around R. Well, we don't really know exactly how the chromosome is going to be condensing and around what it's going to be condensing. We know that, yes, the chromatin is going to be condensing, not the chromosome, but not in which way, and not that it's a chromosome to begin with. So B is going to cancel. However, histones P and R are made of proteins around which the DNA molecule Q is wrapped. And so the DNA molecule can fit inside the nucleus. That is true. However, this is not part of prophase mitosis and does not describe what's going to happen in prophase of mitosis. So we can cancel that out. However, the linked groups of histone P and R are an associated DNA Q form strands that fold and twist together to form a chromatid. Exactly what I'm looking to hear. Folding and twisting and forming chromatid during prophase of mitosis is exactly what happens. And that's letter D. Let's see one. How many copies of each DNA molecule will be found in a cell at the start stages of a mitotic cell cycle? Shown. Okay. At the start of G1, we're only going to have one copy of the DNA molecule. At the start of cytokinesis, we're also going to only have one copy of the DNA molecule because during prophase, I'm sorry, at the start of cytokinesis, no, at the start of cytokinesis, actually, inside one cell, we're going to have two copies, and that's because we still didn't separate the two cells, meaning that we still have two nuclei. So we can imagine this cell before G1, at the beginning of G1, and then you can imagine this cell before cytokinesis, you have two nuclei, each with its own set of chromosomes, so, you know, double the amount of DNA, and then, you know, cytokinesis is going to happen, and there will be constriction of cytoplasm and everything, and so basically, until now, we have two copies, that is correct, is that your B? One characteristic of DNA is that it is a universal genetic code. What's meant by a universal genetic code? All living organisms use the same triplet code for amino acids, that is correct, all DNA triplet codes for different amino acids, actually, no, okay. In all organisms, we have the same code as all different organisms for for like the same for amino acids. Okay, not all DNA triplet codes for an amino acid. All living organisms contain the same four nucleic acids. No, it's just letter A. Okay, number twenty three. Which statements about mRNA is correct? It's a polymer made of nucleotides all joined with hydrogen bonds. mRNA does not have any hydrogen bonds with it because basically it's a single strand that looks something like this so it's not really joined by any hydrogen bonds okay each nucleotide subunit contains the sugar ribose that is correct and that's why it's called rna r stands for ribonucleic acid no, ribo comes from ribose it always has an equal proportion of adenine and uracil well no it would have this I would, I would say this if something was double-stranded. And if it's double-stranded, meaning it's going to have two strands, and there's A, and there's U. And whenever there's a U, there'll be A. There's a U, there's an A. And so obviously, there's just gonna have a one-to-one -one ratio, but now you're just saying that there's a single strand with random amounts of A and random amount of U. And so you'd not say that, of course not, okay? The mRNA sequence is identical to the template strand of DNA. No, it's not identical, because basically it's a copy, meaning that Whatever is on the DNA, we're going to be copying it. So if it, for example, was A, T, and then C, this is for DNA, mRNA is going to copy it, meaning it's going to be the complementary of the DNA. So not identical. It's not going to be A, T, C, number one. It's going to have U, that is, if it was identical. Number two, it is going to be opposite. So here it's going, instead of A, we're going to have U, because this is what's complementary. The uracil nucleotide is going to come and bind to it. The uracil, basically, the, the nucleotide with the uracil base is going to come and try to basically form hydrogen bonds with A, right? And then basically, another one, another basically, which who is going to come here? It's going to be A, and it's going to form bonds here. And then here we 
we're gonna have G, and then these bonds are gonna be broken down again, and we're gonna have a single strand called mRNA, which is a copy of the DNA, complementary to the sense strand of DNA. The diagram shows part of the process of translation, so basically the answer here is B. The diagram shows part of the process of translation, and here we have a molecule of tRNA. So what are the names of structures labeled X, Y, and Z? So we can see by the clover leaf shape, this entire shape is a clover leaf shape, by the way. If you don't know what the clover leaf shape is, it's basically you know this um, type of shape. I'm not sure. It's basically like the leaf that is used for luck. I'm not sure, but basically it's letter Z and it's going to be tRNA. And then for X, we have here the anticodon. Okay, so X is going to be the anticodon, and for Y, because this is translation, then it's going to be tRNA in front of mRNA. So this is going to be the codon. Okay, letter. At number 25, the, di the DNA triplets of the genes are translated as amino acids or stop signals during protein synthesis. The table shows some of these triplets. DNA triplet and then the name of amino acid and we can, okay, we can, what could it be the effect of one of substitution mutations in the triplet coding for tri tyrosine? Okay, the triplet is translated into cysteine. Okay, so a substitution mutation, meaning basically instead of A, for example, we could have well, let's see, G, for example, that is okay, that's fine. But here we can see that, uh, yeah, not just a single substitution, it's actually two. For, for example, but instead of, for example, T, we can also have C, that's correct. Okay, that is correct. It's one. The triplet is translated as tryptophan. Okay, so it can be translated as tryptophan as a result of a single substitution. Let's look at this. No, it could not, because here we have only one code for tryptophan, it's ACC. To go from ATA or ATG to ACC, you need to switch two of those. Okay, so that's wrong. The triplet is translated as tyrosine. So is it, yeah, it could be because basically here, instead of A, we have G. And that's a su substitution. However, basically it's a silent mutation, doesn't really have any effect. Okay, translation stops at this triplet. Okay, let's see. If we have a substitution here and switch A with C or G with C, yes, the transition could stop at this triplet, that is correct. So it's really 1, 3, and 4, which is letter C. Which row identifies cells with plasmodesmata? Fluum sieve tube element. Now, plasmodesmata are going to be these connections between the cells, right? So basically, these are going to be the such plasm strands that are going to be connecting to plant cells, right? Now, fluum sieve tube elements are going to have lots of plasmodesmata as well as companion cells. However, xylem vessel elements are not going to have it because they're really dead vessels. These dead cells are going to not have any cytoplasm inside them to begin with because they're broken down and removed by autophagy. Okay, and that's to reduce, you know, resistance against water. And okay, which means about the aplastins and plast pathways are correct. And now, plast pathway water molecules move through three spaces, three spaces in the cellulose cell walls of plant roots. That is correct. And the simplest pathway, water molecules diffuse through the cytoplasm A and, and plasma matter of cells. That is correct. Okay, water molecules traveling through the plant tissue move by mass flow along the aplast pathway. Do they move by mass flow through plant tissue? Well, yes, because basically we're looking at, for example, in the case of xylem vessel element, don't we call this an aplast pathway? I guess we do. And so basically we're going to go ahead and, and say that this is true. Casparian strip blocks the simplast pathway and forces all water molecules to enter the cytoplasm of the endoderma cells. Actually, it blocks the apoplast pathway, not the simplast, and hence leads them to enter the cytoplasm because we know simplast actually contains the cytoplasm, which is really one of the options. So please make sure to not confuse since it's already above, in, like in front of you. 27, 1, 2, and 3 only, which is letter B. 28. Where does water evaporate during transpiration? So during transpiration, water is going to be um, evaporating. Is it in intercellular spaces? No. Or is it in leaf surface? Or is it in mesophyll cell walls and stomatopores? In mesophyll cell walls all the way to the air spaces. 29. The diagram shows the outline of three zerphotic leaves in the same type of three different conditions, P, R, and S. Which description of water potential of the cells in layer Y is correct? Water potential of cells in layer Y. So let's see, compared to anything, really no, it's just really comparing to letter layer Y and layer. Okay, so we can see here that uh, layer Y for P is way more flat compared to this one, meaning that actually there's lots of water weighing this down, okay? Lots of water, and so it's weighing this down. So obviously here we have such a high water potential. However, here we have such a low water potential, and the lowest water potential will be here in our lowest water potential. So lower than P and S, yes. And then lower than P, yes. Higher than R and S, 
Yes, okay, that's correct. Number 30, the photomicrograph shows the transverse section of the leaf and the species of grass. This is a perfect drawing if you'd like to practice for paper 3. Please make sure to try and draw this. You're going to benefit a lot out of it. This is especially adapted to grow in a dry habitat, which row correctly explains how the features help the grass to grow in this habitat. Hair-like structures increase internal humidity, decrease external humidity, increase internal humidity. Okay, let's see. The hair-like structures actually increase internal humidity because they're going to be trapping the humid air and hence helping to reduce transpiration. Because obviously when you live in a dry habitat, you'd like to reduce the loss of water. And that's what you do. You try and in increase the water potential, or let's say, yeah, basically try to reduce the diffusion gradient of water vapor. And so basically that's by trapping water because when there's more water vapor inside, more water vapor so obviously you're gonna have a less likelihood because then you're going to be decreasing the diffusion gradient of water here it's high there it's high so you know the diffusion gradient is going to be low so it's going to be such a low rate of diffusion that really a low rate of transpiration is going to happen leaf shape decreases external humidity or increases internal humidity and actually it does increase internal humidity because you can see it's rolled in order to trap humid air which if you zoom in you can see these droplets of water all trapped and so that's that's lo that's lovely okay increase internal humidity that's what they're seeing which statements support the theory of active loading of sucrose into companion cells the ph decreases in the cell wall of the companion cells compared with the cytoplasm or the ph decreases in the cytoplasm of the companion cells compared with the cell wall or the ph decreases in the companion cells in the sieve tube elements or the ph decreases in the sieve tube elements compared with the companion cells actually all of these are wrong except for letter a because in letter a he says that it decreases in the cell wall which is actually correct because what happens at the beginning of loading was basically that hydrogen ions are going to be pumped out of the companion cell and into the cell wall right and then they're going to be moving back into the cell and that leads to you know in uh, active terms and not active transport actually secondary active transport or indirect active transport which is basically when hydrogen ions are going to move back into the companion cells with a new friend with them right so let me draw this for you this is the companion cell and this is its cell wall let's pretend okay and in the cell wall we're going to have you know these pumps they're called atp powered proton pumps so they're atp powered proton pumps Okay, what happens here is basically act transport okay and what happens is the hydrogen ions are going to be pumped out of here back to transport and where into the cell wall okay so into here into the cell wall and you know that hydrogen ions are going to lead to the decrease in ph so there will be a decrease in the ph and this leads then basically to the increase in concentration of protons over here and so obviously diffusion of protons back into the cells and that's through you know their channel proteins which are going to be you know, co-transporter proteins because they allow for more than one substance to enter with the hydrogen. And it's a specific type of substance in this case. It's uh, sucrose, okay? And, or maybe amino acids, it depends on the type of co-transporter protein, okay? And that's secondary or indirect type of transport. So this really is exactly what has happened in over here. You can see that the pH decreases over here because hydrogen ions, and that's the companion cell of the sieve tube element. Which properties of water are essential for its role in the transport of blood and mammals? High density of vaporization. Really, it's not necessary for the transport. However, solvent for polar substances, yes. But this is important in cooling us down as mammals, or maybe us in like as humans and then mammals by panting. So mammals, for example, let's say dogs or let's say um people like for example let's say uh, uh, dogs or let's say um you know cats for example they're going to be panting because they don't have sweat glands and so when they're pant they pant they're going to have water on their lips and so that's going to be evaporating and when it evaporates because water has a high rate heat of vaporization that's going to take lots of energy away from the body of the uh, dog or cat and it's going to lead to cooling them down during hot you know basically times however for us we're going to be sweating a lot when it comes to you know when the weather is really high and so that leads because so that leads to you know water having high heat of heat vaporization and taking lots of energy away with it in order to evaporate and leave your skin and so cooling you down as a result it has nothing to do with the transport of blood okay the diagram shows some events that happen between the plasma and the red blood cells in the circulatory system what do the numbers one two three and four represent the plasma over here so one uh represents basically chloride okay let's look at what it actually represents so obviously what combines with h2o to form as uh, h2so3 is obviously going to be carbon dioxide okay it's either b or d so we can cancel out a and c okay and then number two over here we can see that h2co3 is going to be dissociating 
okay and then basically forming what exactly and it's going to be reacting with what to form hemoglobin and reacting with what and let's let's look at this so obviously here it's going to be associating into hydrogen ions and hco3 minus ions right and these are going to be going outside and now chloride ions are going to come back inside and that's because you know you want to keep a balance of the ph that's known as the chloride shift or chlor i'm sorry chlor yeah chloride shift okay and this is the chloride shift and because you you want to keep a balance in the charge and i'm sorry shift right you want to keep a, ba a balance in the charge outside and inside their blood cell so what happens basically is when you have negative ions leaving you have negative ions entering and same thing is going to happen like opposite Opposite directions though when it comes to the lungs so this is really in the side of for example muscles or inside of you know active active organs okay but when it comes to the lungs what's happening is actually the opposite uh, hco3 is going inside and, and basically chloride ions are going outside it's, it's still is called the chloride shift just in the opposite direction let's go back to what we were saying now hydrogen now hydrogen ions are going to be you know reacting with hbo8 forming hb because as a result and then basically the hb is going to be reacting with hydrogen ions really we just write it directly like this because it's easier and that forms hemoglobinic acid okay and this is basically the labeling so two is going to be h2 H, okay and three is going to be hydrogen ions and four chloride ions and that's letter b now 34 the diagrams show the valves in the heart when viewed in cross section from above at different stages in the cardiac cycle so we can see here the semilunar valves are closed at this stage however the outer ventricular valves are closed in diagram two so what stages in the cardiac cycle are shown so we can see here that the atrioventricular valves are open so here what happens is basically maybe atriosystole because really during atriosystole the seminal valves are closed also during the diastole the seminal valves are also closed so it's either atriosystole or diastole however ventricular systole does not work and yeah because obviously when there's systole ventricles the ventricles are going to contract pushing blood out of the heart and we know the structure of the heart is something like this right i'm going to just draw the boxes because uh, this is a bit easier to draw on you know using the ipad so let's go ahead and say okay we have um, the ventricles, we have here left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, and right ventricle, right? And then here, for example, we're going to have the sublunar valves, right? So these are basically what goes out of the ventricle, sublunar valves, okay, the yellow. And then for the atrium, we're going to have the here atrioventricular valves, okay? atrioventricular valves okay and these are basically what you're seeing right here this is this and then this is that okay so basically when what when when this when the heart is relaxing the seminal valves generally close okay and when the atria are going to be pushing blood from you know the right for example from the atria to the ventricles these are going to be open however the atria vent the seminal valves will also be closed okay and when basically the ventricle is going to be contracting and pushing blood out it's going to go through the semilunar valve and so that means that it has to be open during ventricular systole that's the only case when it's open that's why letter a is the answer now 35 where our squamous epithelial cells find in human gas exchange system tracheal bronchus or alveolus actually only in the alveolus and trachea we have ciliated epithelial cells in the bronchus we have ciliated epithelial cells however in, the in alveolus we have the squamous or flat epithelial cells okay which okay which statement about gas exchange between air and the alveoli and the blood on the pulmonary capillaries is correct the oxygen concentrations in the capillaries leaving the pulmonary artery is higher than the oxygen concentration in the alveoli actually this is wrong because we know that as we breathe in the alveoli are going to contain high concentration of oxygen however the pulmonary artery is a deoxygenated blood vessel meaning it barely has any oxygen so absolutely not gases must diffuse across the endothelium of the capillaries and the endothelium of the alveoli actually it's not really a must for gases to diffuse through the endothelium of the capillary because we know that between the capillary and endothelial cells we have holes and so sometimes gases might like to sneak out through those and not follow the rules so also be wrong for letter c the the elastic fibers in the alveoli allow the walls the walls to the of the alveoli to expand to increase the surface area of the alveoli for diffusion into the pulmonary capillary that is a correct statement because as you breathe in the alveoli are going to expand and that makes it such that that increases the surface area and oxygen is going to have a greater surface area to diffuse to your capillaries so c correct he says breathing out reduces the carbon dioxide concentration gradient between the blood in the pulmonary uh, in the pulmonary capillaries and in the air 
And the alveoli actually no. The concentration gradient is always constant, and the reason for this is because as you breathe out and lose some carbon dioxide to the air, you are gaining more carbon dioxide as you respire and metabolize the food that you've just eaten. And so the carbon dioxide that's produced in your body is going to be delivered via the pulmonary artery to the or to the uh, alveoli all over again. And so what you lose, you will gain. No. Uh, lost no gain, I guess. <laughs> anyway, uh, C is the answer. 37. The average thickness for some structures in the human respiratory system are shown. The structure here is the human cell membrane. The average thickness of the structure is 5. And then, for example, here we have uh, alveolar wall cells, cytoplasm 190, cytoplasm of the capillary wall cells 90, tissues between the alveolar wall and the capillary walls 300. Okay, a molecule of oxygen in the alveolar space next to the wall of the alveolus. Okay. Is next to the end is in the alveolar space next to the wall of the alveolus. Interesting. What's the shortest distance that the molecule needs to diffuse from its current position to the hemoglobin to, to that fills a red blood cell in the nearest capillary? As you know, the red blood cells touch the cell walls of the capillaries. Okay. Let's start with the diagram. Now we said that the oxygen was right next to the wall of the alveolus, meaning let's say that oxygen is right over here. Okay. And then this is the alveolar cell. It's a squamous epithelial cell. And he said the diameter or basically the width is actually 190. So that's the first number we're gonna jot down, it's 190, okay? And then, before we can cross, actually, we have to pass through the cell membrane. So it's 190 right here. However, there's five nanometers here, five nanometers here. So we're looking at plus five, plus five. Perfect, okay, moving on. Now the oxygen, let's say it passed, okay? Now it's gonna have to go from here to the distance that's basically the distance between the capillary and all the tissues until the capillary okay so that's what he said tissues between the alveolar wall and the capillary wall that's 300 nanometers okay and so we have to add 300 okay plus 300 and then it's gonna cross let's just zoom in like <laughs> a lot okay it's gonna cross the capillary wall now the capillary is going to have squamous epithelial cells i'm sorry yeah, yeah. Okay, and then I'm sorry, endothelial cells. Okay, endothelial cells are gonna have cell membranes which are five nanometers, and then this is ninety based on what he said. Cytoplasm is ninety, and then another, and then okay, so another, and then another five in here. So we're looking at five plus ninety, okay, plus five plus ninety plus five, and then it reaches to the red blood cell crossing the cell surface membrane of the red blood cell, which is five nanometers. If you add all this up, it's 605, which is C. Okay, the following statements refer to the disease tuberculosis, TB, the pathogen is not accessible to the immune system, the bacterial pathogen reproduces slowly, and the pathogen is not very sensitive to antibiotics. So these are just straight facts about tuberculosis. He says, which statements explain why antibiotic treatment for TB takes a long time? Okay, the fact that here we're talking about the immune system has nothing to do with, with the antibiotic treatment, and therefore uh, we don't really care for number one. However, for number two, the pathog bacterial pathogen reproduces slowly. Well, of course, if it reproduces slowly, it's going to take a long time for the TB antibiotic to, you know, kill all the pathogens that are going to be produced later on. Anyway, if the pathogen is not very sensitive to antibiotics, well, of course, if it's not sensitive to antibiotics, that's going to be hindering the treatment, and therefore the option is 2 and 3. And even if, for example, you decided to not consider 2 because you're not convinced, number 1 should be cancelled, so number 2 will be cancelled, and you're only left with 3. And there's no option for 1 and 3 only, there's no option for 3 only, so your only option is to consider taking 2, and 2 does make sense if you think about it a lot. Anyway... The average sizes of some pathogens are shown, and he gave you some pathogens with their sizes in nanometers. One type of air filter has been shown to be effective at preventing any pathogens of 1 micrometer or larger from entering the air system of a room. Okay, let's see. Based on their size and mode of transmission, which disease would the air filter prevent from entering the air system of a room? Okay, 1 micrometer or larger is actually um, like 1,000 nanometers or larger. And from this list, we have three pathogens that are, you know, 1,000, larger than 1,000 nanometers. Okay, but their mode of transmission is not necessarily through air. In the case of macrobacterium tuberculosis, short thing. In the case of plasmodium, it's actually through vectors. And vectors are not necessarily air. <laughs> so we can cancel out plasmodium. Vibrio cholerae also pass through water, so it can be cancelled out as well. Okay, HIV is smaller, so again, it will not be prevented. So the only one prevented over here is mycobacterium tuberculosis. So let's see which one prevented, not prevented is X, and prevented is check. So not prevented, not prevented, not prevented. 
and a successful vaccination program provides a level of immunity where the majority population is protected. There are several factors that can affect the success of a vaccination program, which Roe correctly shows the factors that can affect the success of a vaccination program. Frequent mutation of the pathogen, obviously not that it's going to, yes, it's going to affect the success, it's going to decrease the success. However, basically it is, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. I'm not saying that it does not affect, does affect, however, in a negative way. So yes, because obviously if when there's lots of mutations, like in the case of HIV, the vaccination program will be very, tough because you're gonna to have to create a vaccine every little minute for example in the case of hiv you're gonna to have to keep on creating vaccines and vaccines and they're gonna be non-effective after just maybe two hours or something like that and so obviously that makes the vaccination program very very difficult and very very unsuccessful okay vaccination from eight weeks old doesn't really matter when you start vaccination it just basically it matters that you know there's you know booster booster doses really affect so for example your booster vaccination needs requirements if it is a requirement then obviously the more va- booster doses the less successful the vaccination program is people do not like to go back and keep taking boosters and keep taking stuff they just do not like it okay most people actually do not like vaccination to begin with and if you're asking them to be like being hit with needles like let's say five times that's going to be way too tough for you for for your vaccination program okay pathogen is able to invade t-cells also yes it's going to be affecting the success of the vaccination program because when it affects t-cells the t-cells themselves are going to be killed because you know then they're going to have pathogens on their surface like the non-self antigens and so they're going to be killed and obviously t-cells are a very important part of the immune system whether it's t-killer or t-helper and so when you are killing those the immune system is not going to be functioning as well you're not going to have you know the primary immune response against this artificial you know basically prior you know active immunity you're not going to have the success being so you know great because you know if the pathogen is able to invade the t-cells and obviously that's terrible whether it's basically the pathogen that's causing the disease or the pathogen that that are you are using in your in vac- vaccine maybe you're not using the pathogen however just remember that you know if the pathogen in general is evading the t-cells it's going to be really difficult to you know get t-cells to begin with and you know just have the immune immunity be like building up because like in the case of hiv hiv affects t cells and that results in the immunity being really low a vaccine being injected is actually going to be way too harmful for you because now you do not have a, such a high immunity that even a vaccine can harm you and that's why basically letter b is the answer okay and this is number 14 this was everything for this variant i hope this, this video was useful please make sure to leave any questions that you have as i mentioned down in the comments and any study resources that you have found please make sure to leave them and also as i mentioned if you'd like me to open an instagram account for you to send me your drawings or anything if you have and if you began to draw your uh, your paper, paper three obviously it's really early i think for you to start drawing but it doesn't matter if you are then i would like to help you as well so yeah okay uh, good luck everyone